Thanks everyone for joining us tonight and our apologies. Who would have thought, huh? Technical issues on a, on a Zoom or technological issues these days. Our sincere apologies to everyone for, for getting the late start. Tonight, we're here to answer some of your questions about the cystic fibrosis modulators. People are talking about these drugs a lot. What are they? How do they work? How can I get access? And tonight, we're going to tackle those questions and more. My name's Dr. John Wallenberg. I'm the Chief Scientific Officer at Cystic Fibrosis Canada. And joining me today are Martha McKinney, the Clinic Director at the Saskatoon Pediatric Cystic Fibrosis Clinic. And just to say that Martha is a recent transplant. She spent a number of years uh, at the um, pediatric clinic at Hôpital Saint Justin in Montreal, so it's great to have you with us, Martha. Glad uh, glad you could make it. And Eric Mariglia, who's the Associate of Government Relations and Advocacy, will be our moderator today. Eric, over to you for some housekeeping items. Thanks, John. So we've received a number of questions in advance of today's session, uh, which we grouped by theme. I'll read the questions we've received, and our panel. Uh, John and Martha uh, will provide a response. If you wish to answer a, uh, if if you wish to answer a question, please use the chat box um, found at the bottom rhythm, ri ribbon of the Zoom and the center of the screen. Due to the high volume of questions, and thank you for those who submitted a question, we may not be able to answer all the questions live. We will provide a written summary of the questions asked prior and during today's session in our blog. We will provide a link to the blog on social media, as well as a link to the recording of this session. Just as a reminder in terms of our advocacy efforts for Trikafta, we are still awaiting for an application to be posted on the Health Canada website for Trikafta. And in the meantime, we continue to move forward with our various advocacy initiatives, including our all party emergency access to Trikafta caucus meetings. And with that, John, over to you for an overview of CF modulators and where each is at in terms of the drug system. Okay, thanks. And let me just confirm that I can share here. I wanna share this. And can people see the slideshow? Eric, can you confirm? Yeah, I can see people nodding. Okay, that's terrific, thank you. So everyone, thanks for that question, uh, uh, Eric. So what are the high, high I, you know, they're called highly effective modulators um, for reasons because the clinical benefit is significant, but basically the CFTR modulators. Uh, I'm gonna run through a bunch of slides just to sort of explain what they are um, and hopefully get everybody on the same page. I was, uh, we had a session a while back where one of these questions came up. Somebody asked, we were talking about the drugs and drug access and somebody had asked the question of water modulators. So we had made an assumption that everybody knew what they were and that was probably incorrect. So we have to start by understanding that cystic fibrosis is, is a genetic disease, right? This is something that's caused by uh, a defective gene. It's inherited. Uh, and what's important is, is that there's a gene product and the gene product of the cystic fibrosis gene is something called the cystic fibrosis transmembrane conductance regulator, CFTR for short. And this is, you might see a picture of this if you're ever looking at uh, and some of the explanations. And this is sort of a diagram of what the molecule or the protein looks like. And what's important to know here is if you see something like this, this structure here, right here, is actually the wall of a cell. It's called a membrane, but you can think of it as the wall of a cell, like the wall of a house. And then this part here is on the inside of the cell. And what this protein does is it sits in that wall of the cell and it kind of works like a window. It opens and it closes it and allows stuff to leave the, the inside of the cell and go out into the outside environment. And actually, it's, it's for chloride ions, so half of salt, and, but water tends to go out with it. If we look at where it's situated in a cell, imagine that this here is, uh, uh, is a lung cell. And what you have at the bottom, that's where you have, would, would have the blood vessel and that's where the blood would be. And up at the top, that's where the air is in the, in the lungs. And where you would find that this protein is on that air surface of the cell. And the way it gets made is important. It starts with the gene. Now the gene is part, it's, it's basically part of a, a master recipe book that's stored in the, in the library of the cell, which is the nucleus. So if you wanna get that, if you wanna make that product, it gets transcribed into a recipe card, which then gets sent to the workshop and where this window gets made. Once the window is made, it gets finished, it gets polished, and then it gets installed, whoops, it gets installed in the wall of the cell. 
So you can see there's a whole bunch of different places where that whole process can go wrong. On top of that, once the window gets installed in the wall of the cell, sometimes it doesn't function properly. There are 2,000 known, over 2,000 known mutations of cystic fibrosis. And so there's all kinds of different problems that can go wrong. That's even when you're getting protein being made. So the first thing that, that they, the drug company started to do is they were looking at mutants where the protein was made and it was installed in the wall of the cell, but the window wasn't working properly. That was the easiest one to fix. And so they looked for drugs that would actually allow the, uh, the window to open and close. And those are called potentiators. And it's for a particular type of mutation, obviously, where the window is installed but not working. And so this is a drug called Kaleidico, and it's particular for certain mutations. Once they had that problem solved, they could go on and start looking at some of the other problems that are in the making of the protein that happened earlier on, because those problems often are associated with problems opening the window, even if the protein does get made. And so these are called correctors. And so for something like Delta F508, which we'll, we'll talk about later, but that's a mutant where there's a problem making the protein and once it's installed, it still doesn't work. So now you need a combination drug that fixes the process, the, the manufacturing and the opening of the window. The first one was Orcambi. The second one is Simdeco, and it's a combination of a potentiator plus a corrector. And then the one that we're talking about most commonly nowadays is Tricaftin. and it's actually a combination of three different drugs, Ivacaftor and then two of the correctors. So I mentioned earlier that they work, they're specific for different types of mutations because of the way they work. So Kaleidico, which is the first one, it's good for what we call class two and three mutations. And that's about four to 5% of the Canadian CF population. And those, that's the first generation of these drugs. The second generation of these drugs, that's the two, two combinations. So the Orcambi and Simdeco. And those are good for patients who have two copies of that one special mutation, F508-DEL. So that's a particular mutation. It's the most common one in Canada. And about 50% of the Canadian population have uh, two copies of F508-DEL. The third one, which is Trikafta, and it also works on that same mutation, now F508-DEL. But in this case, it's work, it's so effective in that you, you only need to have one copy of F508-DEL. And that's actually quite surprising if you think about it. If you're fixing a broken protein, you might think, well, if you've got twice as many broken copies, you should have a bigger impact. And yet the case of Trikaft is it seems to work just about as well in patients who have one copy of F508-DEL as in patients with two copies of F508-DEL. So I think I'm going to stop at that question right there. Um, uh, uh, it, wh what's up next there, um, uh, Eric? Uh, thanks, Sean. Yeah, I, I, I have a question uh, here for you, which uh, can you please just elaborate on how a drug goes from a petri dish to the patient, and what is the overall journey of a drug from development to dispensing, and how long does it take to get from the bench to the bedside? That's a great question. Okay, um, I, I do have some slides for that. Thanks for that. Um, we're going to skip over this one. It talks about where the drugs are in the process. So I'll, I'll, we might come back to that one later. Um, in terms of getting a drug from bench to bedside, it's a pretty long process, and it really starts with um, you know, basic biomedical research. You know, you take a broken car to the to the mechanic, and the first thing they do is they they have to diagnose what the problem is. They have to understand where the problem is before they can fix it. And that's really what we're doing with basic biomedical research is trying to understand the biological problem behind the disease. Uh, and you know, that's that's a, an a, a, an incremental process, right? There's you know, people do a bit of work and then the next person builds on that and builds on that and builds on that. And that's very much incremental. And it's really trying to understand that complex biology that you have. And these are all the different systems in the cells and the way they're all interconnected. And it helps you identify, okay, where is there a a target that maybe if I hit that target, it's going to change the outcome. So it's really what we're doing is we're looking for targets to, to be able to identify drugs. Once we've identified a target, we start getting into what is really that clinical science aspect of it. So we're starting to move away from what you would call ac pure academic curiosity driven research and looking more into, okay, how can we change that information into something more practical? And this is a whole bunch of different steps. The more you are on the left-hand side, the more some of these activities might be done by academic researchers or people publicly funded. And the further you go to the right, the more it's the bailiwick of industry. 
And so, uh, you know, y y you've got your target and you start to look for chemicals that actually hit the target that do what you want it to do. But once you've got a hit, that's not necessarily a drug, that's just a chemical. And some of the hits might actually be toxic. So you have to be able to change the chemistry into something that looks like a drug, get into animals, and then you get into the phase, the, the human trials. And that's the phase one, two, and three clinical trials. And pay attention a little bit to the numbers up here. So phase one trials tend to be tens of patients. A phase one is in normal, healthy individuals. A phase one B is in patients. And it's really the focus there is, are these drugs safe? Can you give them to people and not have serious adverse events? Phase two, you're looking at hundreds of people. And now you're really looking for a clinical signal. Is this doing what you expected it to do? And when you get into phase three, you're looking, typically you're looking at thousands of people, although in rare diseases like cystic fibrosis, you might be looking at multiples hundreds again of diseases. And there you're really looking, you're confirming the efficacy and you're getting statistical significance. And you know, you're, then you're, getting, you're setting yourself up and getting the data for regulatory approval. Let's look at the example of cystic fibrosis. So in cystic fibrosis, we're gonna go quickly through these. The gene was discovered in 1989. That was the target we were looking for. It was the first time we discovered a, a gene this way that we had a lot to learn and it took a while to be able to get to understand the biology, to figure out the structure of the protein, what it really was doing and to develop a way of assaying it. You know, if you hit that target, what's the signal? So you had to be able to do that. The next step really was when uh, uh, our sister organization in the United States started investing in a company to screen for chemicals that would hit that target. And that was in 2000. So that took 11 years. If we jump ahead now to, whoops, I don't know what's happening here, but that's special. Okay. So if we jump ahead to where the, the phase one trial started, that took another six years. And then when we finally got the results at the end of the clinical trials, that was in 2011, that was another five years. And it was finally approved in 2012. And I'm sorry, I don't show up, but it took 23 years from the beginning there to the end. And apologies for, for that particular, that was 23 years to get there. Um, Eric, did we, what was the uh, second half of that question? Was there another part to it? The, well, I, I uh, the last question was I said was, can you please elaborate on the Petri dish to the patient? And then uh, you, you did go over the, the journey of the drug of development uh, to dispensing and how long it takes from bench to bedside. Next question I have here, John, is that what, what role do clinical trials have in getting new medicines to people? and building the evidence base for new medicines. Moreover, what is CF Canada doing to help bring new clinical trials to Canada? Okay, that's great. So we talked a little bit about the clinical trials here and about really what the purpose of them is, but there's, there's more to what they do. I mentioned that they provide some of the evidence that is used when you're filing for drugs. So one of the things that we're, 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 you would look at, for example, in the case of Kaleidico, um, you can measure, so who is benefiting? You, you might have a bunch of different people, different types of mutations in a clinical trial, and you can sort of narrow down and say, oh, well, look, it's the people with this mutation. In this particular case, we, we pretty much knew that these people, the drug was designed for these people, and it confirmed that those. And it, it sort of gives us the average, if you will, benefit, 10% increase in lung function, a third less in pulmonary exacerbations, and patients generally saw an increase in, in uh, their BMI. But there's another thing that the clinical trials show us, and they, they show us things like, well, you know, not everybody responds the same to drugs. And that's actually important to know. And the next slide that we're gonna look at, this is data from, from Tricasta, phase two trial of Tricasta. And what you can see is that each bar here is one individual. And what you're looking at is, is a, the distance away from this horizontal line. And the bigger the bar is up, the bigger the change or the improvement in their lung function over the, the period of the clinical trial, which uh, was 28 weeks. And down here, you can see that there are some people who actually, they continue to progress, their health continue to get worse. The different colors are people who are on, actually on the drug, and the people in the gray bars are people who didn't get drug. And so you can see some people who didn't get drug improved. 
right? And some people who did get drug continue to deteriorate. But this shows that even if the, the median benefit, the average benefit, which is around 13 or 14 percent for Trikafta, is really, really good, there's still a big individuality in terms of the response. Not everybody is exactly the same. And this is just a measure of, of the um, of the, the, the lung response here. This isn't, you know, I mean, Trikafta will have an, a benefit on pancreatic function, digestion, we saw it on BMI as well and on different aspects of it. So it, it gives a lot of information about how people are going to respond to a drug. What are we doing about it? Well, one of the things that we're doing is we, we set up in, in 2018, we set up a clinical trial network. We started with six sites across the country. And the reason we wanted the clinical trial network was to be able to get more Canadians involved in, in clinical trials. It does a couple of things. It gives us Canadian data, but it also means that we've got people in Canada, Canadians with CF who are actually benefiting from these drugs. And the more people we can get on these drugs and get on clinical trials, because there's often rollovers, if there's a clinical benefit, the patients tend to stay on the drug while the process continues to get a, a, a drug approved. And so we were able, we can increase the, the number of patients who are involved. And in the first year of the, the, the clinical trial network, we were actually able to double the number of newly enrolled patients in clinical trials. Our statistics of, uh, are, aren't really going to be uh, easily measured for the, the subsequent years because of COVID-19 kind of threw a bit of a, a monkey wrench into recruiting patients. But what we did do this year is we increased the number of uh, sites that are now members of the clinical trial network to 10. So we've now got better distribution across the country. We added Saskatoon. We added one site in Montreal. There's a site at Quebec City, which has a bunch of satellite sites in eastern Quebec. And there's a site in Halifax. So now we go really from coast to coast and we've got much better geographic coverage of the country. Um, and with that, I think we can take a pause here. And let me Thank see if I can go. Oh. Thanks, John. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. McKinney, I'm going to turn it over to you. And uh, the question I have for you is, um, how do modulators fit into the overall continuum of care for cystic fibrosis? What role do they play in treating the disease and um, its symptoms? Thanks, that's a, a really interesting question. And let me just bring my screen up here and share. Uh, so the change in cystic fibrosis now is that um, we're going from uh, in the past where we've just been able to treat the symptoms of CF. You have your airway treatments, your digestive treatments, and your other treatments to actually going to treating the cause of CF. And again, this is just another diagram here of that CFTR protein that John uh, showed you before. So as John pointed out, uh, the <laughs> CFTR uh, mutations lead to a protein that just doesn't quite come out right and doesn't function the way it should. So what these modulators do is they help the protein to function better. This is again, a diagram of those six different mutation classes that John talked about that um, uh, lead to cystic fibrosis. And they all have a slightly different effect on the CFTR protein. So what the modulators do is they help the CFTR that is altered function better. Now it doesn't have to function perfectly, but it has to function well enough to get by. And uh, that can lead to improvement in CFTR and CF symptoms. And we'll talk a bit about that. Again, this is just discussing potentiators and correctors that John talked about. And then the different options that we have, the ivacaftor that helps the protein get to the cell um, function, makes that channel function, the combination medications that help that protein get to the cell wall and then help it function better. So what are the effects? Um, or another question that, that people often ask. Um, so the effects of CFTR modulators are uh, 
pretty much systemic and we'll talk about that. The effects on the respiratory symptom, as John pointed out, talking about some of the results of the clinical trials, or improvement in pulmonary function test, which we think reflects um, lung health, uh, slower decline in pulmonary function, so you preserve better pulmonary function for longer, fewer pulmonary exacerbations and a longer time between pulmonary exacerbations, and that's a big one for people with CF, is having to have IVs, uh, be in the hospital, uh, not feel well, and then improve scores on some quality of life measures. So in general, people feel better. The role in other, organis uh, other organ systems is still being worked out. Uh, so this is a diagram from a paper showing the different organ systems that um, can be affected by CF. Most of the studies done so far with Ivacaftor because it's what we have the most experience for with looking at effects outside of the lung. But as we get more and more experience with all the different uh, medications, uh, we'll get more of an idea of the signal uh, of how these help uh, have an effect on other organ systems other than the lungs. Because these medications are all oral, they're pills, you take them twice a day. Um, they're fairly easy to take and also they go through your system and are uh, effective in different organ systems. It's not like you take an inhaled treatment, it goes straight into your lungs. You take your enzymes, it goes straight into your intestines. These are um, medications that help affect the CFTR in many different organ systems at the same time. Thank you, uh, Dr. McKinney. Uh, can you please tell us about the challenges that physicians face in prescribing modulators? And what would help to address these challenges? Sure. So the first thing, if you're wondering if a modulator is right for you, um, speak with your clinic staff. Uh, we're all fairly up to date with what's going on with modulators and can help you determine whether these are the right medications for you. Uh, look at your uh, gene mutations and CFTR and talk about the, the pros and cons of the different medications. Also, there are a couple of good websites you can go to, of course, this uh, Canadian Cystic Fibrosis uh, CF Canada website, and then the US CF Foundation also has a website if you want uh, a second place to look. So challenges uh, for prescribing medications, first is finding the right medication for the right mutation. Uh, we're still searching for options for people who have what are called nonsense or class one mutations where they don't even make the CFTR protein. So if you don't have a protein for the, these medications to work on, they can't do anything. So there's still a lot of active research going on to look for um, treatments for people who have those type of mutations. And also for people who have two other mutations that aren't Delta F501, trying to find an option for them. Uh, the other issue is availability. Again, as John pointed out, uh, Ivacaftor has been approved and it's been in clinical usage for several years. And it's fairly easily available in Canada for people who qualify. Uh, Ivacaftor Lumacaftor and Ivacaftor Tazacaftor are clinically available. They've been approved by Health Canada. Doctors can prescribe them, but um, it's paying for them that tends to be more of the issue. And then Ivacaftor, Lumacaftor, Alexacaftor, which is Trikafta, is in the process of being submitted for Health Canada approval. And it's been approved for fast tracking, um, but this is probably about a six to 12 month process even with the fast track. So the big problem are finances. So Ivacaftor is covered by many provincial and private pharmaceutical plans. 
Uh, but Iva Luma and Iva Taser are less widely covered, depending on which province you live in, whether you have private insurance, and what kind of uh, other qualifications you may have to get it covered. And these are very expensive medications. Uh, so uh, it's extremely, extremely rare that uh, anyone could pay out of these out of pocket. Um, the Trikafta right now is available for limited compassionate use for people who have severe CF lung disease. Um, and the coverage is yet to be determined. That's going to go through the review process also to see um, if it will be publicly covered and also once it's approved whether um, private insurers will pay for it. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. McKinney. And it seems there's a lot of information about modulators out there. What should patients do if they have specific questions about whether or not a modulator is suitable for them? So if you're wondering if a modulator is suitable for you, again, speak to your clinic staff um, and they'll be able to help guide you through the process and explain it to you. And then again, um, secondary sources of information, uh, particularly the CF Canada website and the, the US CFF uh, that have uh, lots of information about modulators, how they work and, and who uh, they may be the right medication for. Perfect, thank you. Uh, so before we go to our live questions, I will put this last advanced question to the both of you. How can patients, CF Canada and clinicians work together to improve access to modulators? Well, first of all is uh, a lot of issues with regarding medication uh, availability and approval uh, go through the various levels of government. So talk to your government leaders, uh, phone up your uh, provincial uh, member of parliament, uh, phone up your federal member of parliament, drop off a letter, drop off a postcard, things like that, just so that the issue is on their radar. And talk to your family and friends and let them know also, and, and they can call up their uh, legislators and, and that helps. The other thing that's a bit of an American issue is be aware of your insurance coverage. Um, if it comes up, to where you have a possibility of switching insurance companies or things like that, or your employer is looking at insurance options or you're looking at private medication insurance options, talk to your insurance company, find out what is covered and what isn't covered and keep in mind things like lifetime caps, uh, what medications are covered and what medications might be exempted so that you have the right um, coverage uh, that works for you and for your family. I'd say, you know, pay attention to the CF Canada website and some of the social media. We're often putting up um, opportunities where people can participate. Uh, we sometimes have template letters. Eric, you're familiar with a lot of the things that we're putting in front of people to the tools just to help people to do what Martha was saying. Get in front of politicians, get in front of your local reps and so on. Let them know how important this is for you. The, the other thing I'd say is you can also write Vertex or other companies that are, are working on CFTR modulators and, and tell them how much you appreciate them working on it and how important these medications are to you. Um, uh, you know, the five minutes writing off a letter, sending off a letter may, may do some good. Well, perfect. Uh, thank you both uh, uh, for answering that. And we're gonna go over to our live questions now. So I'm just gonna switch over. So the first uh, question I have here is, um, what would be the next modulator revolution after Trikafta? Uh, John, do you wanna first speak to that? Um, the next modulator revolution, that's a, it's a, that's a fantastic question. And you know, I, I don't know that there's going to be a quote unquote revolution. I think what we'll see is more of an evolution. Um, one of the things that I think you saw earlier, what I presented was this sort of distribution of, of different responses to by different individuals to, to the different drugs. Um, and, and that's something where, you know, we'd love to, we really want to encourage 
competitor products on the market because you, we might see a different distribution. Individuals may very well respond to different drugs, different competitor drugs in a different way. Um, one of the things that that the other one of the other things that's really important in in Canada, um, ninety percent of the population have uh, at least one copy of the Delta F five hundred eight. But that's Canada. That's North America. If you look elsewhere in the world, there are a lot of other mutations that are you know much more common in different places in different jurisdictions in the world. And and frankly, we even see that um, uh, in Canada uh, where you know. Delta F508 is really common in, in Caucasian populations, not so much in, in other uh, uh, genetic backgrounds, if you will. So that's an area where we might see some further development in terms of improvement for um, modulator type drugs on mutations that are less common or less, uh, or less frequent in, in Canada. That's an area. But I think really the biggest revolution that's going to come is what are we going to do about those people for whom the modulators don't work they've got nothing at this point in time and and there's a lot of work going on now looking at different i'll call them genetic type therapies um it, it might be rna it might be at the level of the dna um it you know what about you know even cell therapies like can we do something with stem cells that'll allow people who who who, who don't have protein right now, could we give them corrected stem cells that might actually give them some protein where they need it? I don't know, Martha, do you have any other thoughts on that? Well, my hope is that competition is going to continue to spur creativity and looking at things from different uh, options. The high throughput techniques that have been developed to help um, find those molecules that you talked about that then get developed into drugs is continuing on and uh, hopefully they'll continue to find uh, better uh, modulator options. And there are several different companies looking at this and the hope is that competition will and success will help bring that cost down and make uh, these medications a little bit more affordable and then more accessible to patients. Then also, as you said, looking at other therapies like gene therapy and, and other targets um, to help patients who don't respond to modifiers or to modulators or even to help them respond better to modulators. Perfect, uh, thank you both. Uh, and just a reminder uh, for uh, everyone who's uh, joined the webinar today that you can submit uh, questions uh, to our panelists in the chat box in the Zoom. Uh, so uh, I invite you to do so if you, you have any questions. Uh, moving on to the next question, uh, just going over back to the live ones here. Is there going to be a push for different types of clinical trials, such as ones for people with liver transplant who may who may ha have normally been excluded from clinical trials in the past. John, do you wanna to speak to this one first? Um, that's, a, that's a really interesting, that's a tough question. For people who are on transplants, I honestly, I cannot answer that. Um, I do know that people in uh, cystic fibrosis uh, is actually an area that's, that's pretty ripe for new models of clinical trials, but they typically looking at, um, you know, people with the rare mutations. So, so for, there's over 2000 mutations of cystic fibrosis. And for about a thousand of those mutations, there are maybe five people in the world who have that mutation or less. So it's not really practical to do clinical trials on that. And so the, the, the question then becomes, uh, you know, can you start doing clinical trials with an N of one where you have a single patient? Um, those sorts of trials are something that are being considered in cystic fibrosis. Um, and, you know, maybe, maybe that's something that would apply for individuals who have had, for example, transplants. I don't know, Martha, any thoughts? Yeah. Uh, the, Initial clinical trials, they really try to make sure things are as safe as possible. And so uh, different conditions are excluded, not necessarily because there is a problem, but just to try to avoid uh, there being a problem that can hide the signal of the clinical trial. So the hope for people who have conditions 
including some types of infection or other uh, conditions such as liver transplant that have been excluded from trials in the past is that either there will be some small trials looking at that, particularly with safety and people who've had liver transplant, or um, that when the medications are approved for other groups of people that they will still be able to get the medication and just be followed closely by their um, by their clinic team. So there may be that we don't need to do clinical trials uh, on uh, people who have factors like certain infections or in people with liver uh, transplant, we may be able to do sort of uh, therapeutic N of ones. Perfect, uh, thank you both. Uh, moving on to the next question, also relating to clinical trials. How do you get access to clinical trials in Canada if your city does not have a site, i.e. Edmonton? That's a great question. You can, you can speak to your clinic staff. Not everybody in, uh, uh, not all clinical trials necessarily are just limited to the, the sites at the clinical trial network. So um, Edmonton might be conducting certain clinical trials independent of whether they're a part of the network or not. I don't know, but also, um, uh, th there is a system, there is a way for referring patients who are at uh, um, clinic sites that aren't running clinical trials to refer them to sites where they are running clinical trials. So just because you don't live in a city that, that happens to have one doesn't mean you can't, um, you can't participate. You can go to our, our website where we have a clinical trial finder, or actually a listing of the various different clinical trials. And if you see, for example, if you're in Edmonton and you see there's a trial you'd, you'd be interested in participating in Calgary, we provide the contact information on that site as well. So you can reach out to the people in Calgary to find out if there's any possibility for a referral. Thank you, John. Moving on to the next question I have here. Uh, has it been proven that in addition to benefiting the lung function, trichafta, uh, also addresses other side effects of CF, such as diabetes. Uh, Dr. McKinney, do you want to perhaps speak to this one? Sure. Um, that's still evolving. Um, the early signal in uh, the trichafta trials are that there's probably some help with BMI. Uh, so weight gain, diabetes, we're waiting to see. A lot of people are, are wondering whether uh, it will help with pancreatic function in general, like exocrine pancreatic function needing to take enzymes. Um, and so far we don't have a lot of signal on that, but some signal on, on weight gain BMI. And uh, diabetes is another one that um, people are anxiously hoping that it will it will have an, a good effect. Um, there were some questions about Ivacaftor. There have been a few for Kaleidico. There have been a few case reports, um, but generally overall, not a lot of improvement. Um, and Trikafta is so new, we're going to have to wait and see. A lot of the positive effects of these uh, medications are long-term. Um, you know, a immediate jump in pulmonary function is great, but long-term improvement of pulmonary function is really what we want to see, long-term improvement in weight gain, long-term improvement in other complications of CF. Also, so far, the trials, uh, Trikafta, the trials published are the 12 and up. So the trial's been completed for six to 12 and that data should be coming out soon. And then the next step in the Vertex trials has been um, being able to, to go down. The next group is usually two to six. We'll see, see, I think that's the next plan. And so the other thing is if we can start these medications in younger patients with CF, will we be able to avoid some of the development of some of the um, later uh, side effects of CF, such as uh, CF diabetes. And that um, will take some time to figure out. So uh, one of the things I would say is that 
Uh, certainly when we first started looking at some of the improvements in lung function, it came as a bit of a surprise to, to a number of people because there was a belief that the damage that was caused to the lungs or to the pancreas wasn't, wasn't reversible. Um, and so some of the benefits that, that people have seen with these drugs has been quite astounding and surprising. So uh, to, to, to Martha's point, we're, it's going to take some time, I think, to bef before we really understand. Um, it, it, I'm just going to throw something to you, Martha. You mentioned something early on uh, about the benefits of these drugs, and you said slowing the rate of decline in terms of lung function. Could you elaborate just a little bit on that for people? So, well, for those of us who are past their early 20s, um, even people without CF, your lung function kind of hits a peak and then it very slowly declines, um, just part of aging. In people with CF, that decline starts earlier and is faster than people who don't have CF or other lung disease. So what they've done in some of the studies is looked at the how quickly the lung function goes down. And in uh, people with CF on uh, some of the modulators, what they found is that that decrease is slower. So that means uh, that you preserve good lung function for longer, usually that you're less sick. It usually also uh, kind of goes along with fewer pulmonary exacerbations, although that can it's not totally correlated. Um, so preserving good health for longer, um, which I think is a goal. And the healthier you are, the better your lung function, the, the better the impact on the rest of your life and your ability to, to do all the activities that you want to do, school, work, sports, life. I guess that would really be seen as you start getting um, earlier and earlier treating patients, the sooner you can get in, if you can slow that rate of decline, I guess the better it is. Yeah, that's that's the thought. Again, you know, these medications haven't been around as long as long enough to see long term signals, you know, ask me what's going to what people with who are taking or can be or trikafta will be like in 10 years. And I can't tell you because we haven't had 10 years to these medications haven't been around that long, um, but the early signals we're seeing is, is that um, it will help slow down the progression of the disease, and that's really important. Perfect, uh, thank you both. Uh, just so um, everyone who's attended the webinar knows, we're gonna go just a tad bit longer than we had scheduled due to the uh, technical delay. So up until about perhaps uh, 7.05. So we have time for just a couple more questions before we uh, end uh, today's session. So the next question that I have here is uh, um, really re relating to what's um, already just been discussed in the previous question, uh, but I will read it off. And it's, um, uh, you mentioned that improve, uh, with Trikafta, I'm, uh, I'm presume this is referring to, you mentioned improving lung uh, capacity with medication. Will it also have an effect on pancreatic functions or will the, pa um, will the patient have to continue taking enzymes? Dr. Uh, McKinney, perhaps you can speak to this. <laughs> Yeah, so there have been some case reports of people with Ivacaftor or Kaleidico with those classes of mutations on Ivacaftor uh, being able to uh, decrease or even stop their enzymes, but it's very patient dependent. Um, the damage to the pancreas happens really, really early uh, in a lot of people with CF who are pancreatico insufficient. It happens before you're born. Um, so trying to get back uh, the uh, pancreatic function, uh, we're not sure yet whether we might be able to get a bit back. Um, the people with, most people with Delta F508 are pancreatico insufficient, not all, but most. And so we'll have to see with time if the more effective modulators like Trikafta or possibly future medications might be helpful in, in helping to rescue a bit the, the damaged pancreas. 
The other effect is that it's, it's not only about enzymes, it's also about how the surface of your intestines are. So the surface of your intestines are a little bit related to the surface of your lungs and that accumulation of mucus and, and um, that airway surface that's affected by the CFTR not functioning. So will people uh, who take these medications be able to absorb better because the surface of their intestines is healthier? And when they absorb better, will they need as, as, as many enzymes or not? Or will they be able to gain weight better on the same amount of enzymes? Will they need fewer calories? Um, than they currently do and things like that. So um, good possibility of, of helping uh, to improve GI health in ways that don't uh, directly uh, address the pancreas or, or digestive enzymes. There may be some other effects too, maybe also some effects on the liver and bile uh, salts and bile acids and things like that that help with digestion. So. I think it's too early to tell right now. Um, we're going to need a little bit more time to see. Thank you. Uh, I think we have time for uh, maybe one or two more questions. Uh, just, I had a question just come in live now. Um, uh, Dr. McKinley, it, it said, uh, you said that lung function decreases faster with age. Why then aren't uh, you focusing on raising funds for your adult population to keep them alive longer and have a better quality of life while all this research is being done to help children is, is the question that has been asked. You know, actually a lot of this research is done to help adults and a lot of the research starts in adults. Um, and a lot of the treatments that are being looked at right now are for both adults and children. We're hoping for the future that uh, being able to treat younger patients with CF will um, help um, prevent the disease from progressing, but there is a lot of focus on trying to prevent the progression in patients who, uh, adult patients with CF and trying to improve uh, quality of life and function. So most of the clinical trials actually start out at 12 and older and actually heavily recruit uh, adults, so 18 and older. So there is a lot of research on adults. And I think, of course, that's an important, very important group. Uh, and the, the whole idea is that no one be left behind. And I can say that it's certainly from the CF Canada uh, perspective, there are, we've just recently developed a new strategic plan, and, and that's precisely where the focus, the priority goes now. It's those who already have established disease and lots of comorbidities. That population, along with the population who don't benefit from modulators, are in need of, of therapies. So, so that work will definitely continue. One um, other point is that um, now with what we have, all the success we've had so far in CF, there are more adults with CF in Canada than there are children with CF. So CF is turning into an adult disease and pediatrics is hoping we don't get left behind. Um, so uh, adults with CF will continue to be a, a big focus, clinical care, programs for adults with CF are continuing to be built. Uh, we're lucky here in Saskatchewan, we have an amazing adult CF team and we work really closely with them to try to have kind of a seamless care uh, throughout uh, the lifespan, um, which is getting longer and longer and, and leading to needs for more uh, and more adult care and more and more research into uh, adults with CF. Thank you both. Uh, I, I'm going to ask one final uh, question before we have our closing remarks. And the final question I have here is, will it be possible to fall pregnant while taking Trikafta? Dr. McKinney, do you want to speak to that first? Uh, yes, it will be. Um, it, it is possible to become pregnant while you're on Trikafta. Um, a lot of the research, again, just like um, uh, people with liver uh, transplants, a lot of the early research 
uh, they exclude pregnant women or ask women to use contraception and actually the men too to use contraception when they're on the research protocols when we don't know what the signal is uh, for the effect of these medications on pregnancy. So far, there are uh, groups in the US and in Canada who, and in Europe who are trying to collect data on women who do become pregnant while they're on these medications to try to follow and make sure that it's safe and uh, uh, that there's no harm to either the mom or the babies. And uh, so far the signal looks good. So that's something we're continuing to look at. Uh, Ivacaftor, I know there's been some signal that there may be a mild increase in fertility in some women on uh, Ivacaftor, that's Kaleidico. So Trikafta will take some more time to see, uh, but so far things look good. They still haven't received a, a uh, authorization for being safe in pregnancy, that's going to take more data, uh, but the results so far are encouraging. I have to say that raises a really intriguing question. You mentioned that um, uh, children are born with cystic fibrosis with symptoms at birth. And so it raises the intriguing question is what happens if, uh, if mom is taking these modulators during pregnancy of a child who would normally have cystic fibrosis? And don't think we're gonna know that one for a long time, but that's a really intriguing question. Yeah, it's being talked about a bit about whether that might be a way of pre preventing some of those early um, uh, changes with uh, CF in utero as if, if a mom knew that the baby had CF, whether treatment could help. Hmm. Well, uh, thank you both very much. And, and thank you uh, to all our attendees for, for tuning in and sending on your questions. Uh, John, I'm going to turn it over to you for some closing comments. Thank you, Eric, and uh, thank you so much for joining us, everyone, today. A special thanks to you, Dr. McKinney, for sharing your expertise with us. Greatly appreciated. Um, I'd like to thank everybody involved putting this webinar together. And again, my apologies to all of our participants for the, some of the technical issues that we had at the very beginning. And thank you all for your patience. This really is a momentous time for, for cystic fibrosis in Canada. Um, the, the, pros, the prospect and the promise of, of these new drugs and Trikafta in particular. Uh, nonetheless, we can't be complacent. We gotta continue to push so that we see these new drugs as available as soon as possible for you and, and the entirety of our CF community. And we spoke to that a little bit today about things that we can do. So please join us next Thursday, December 10th from 6 to 7 p.m. for a deeper dive into how our drug system works and what the possible access pathways for Trikafta are and perhaps how you can help uh, to, to grease the wheels and, and get things moving more quickly. Thanks everyone, have a great evening and uh, we'll see you, uh, see you next time. Bye all.